Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's start with prayer. Loving God, we thank you that we can come before you to honour you and to honour also what you have done in our lives. We pray that as we share in the word, that you will speak to us through your scriptures and that we will be enlightened. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have two readings this morning and I'm going to, or today, and we're going to ask Ben if he would come and bring them to us. Thanks, Ben. Happy Sunday, and I uh, hope you all had a really amazing week and um, that things are going really well for you. Uh, the first scripture this week is Mark 5, 21 to 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he, he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind, behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I only touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realised that the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see, the people crowded against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your sufferings. While Jesus still speaking, while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they had come to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion, with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After, after, putting, uh, after he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talithia Kilman, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Wow, that's just crazy. It's awesome. And the second one is in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 2 to 15. 2 Corinthians 8, 2 to 15. Out of the most severe trials, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But Jesus, as you... As you excel in everything, no, sorry. 
But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved relieved while you are hard pressed, but there, that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will, plenty will supply what they need, so that, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. And this is the word of the Lord. I hope, hope you've enjoyed the reading this morning and um, I can't wait to hear what Russell's got to share with us. It's going to be excellent based on um, those two scriptures. Happy Sunday. Thanks, Ben. <clears throat> there are two fairly full readings there and I just wonder if you'd like to turn your... I mainly want to concentrate on the Second Corinthians reading and I wonder if it would be an opportune time to just turn your... Uh, the program off and just spend a bit of time just looking at that second Corinthians reading and let it sink into you because that's what I want to mainly look at. While you're doing that, uh, just to remind you that on Monday we are having starting up Bible studies on the Christian growing in the Christian faith and that will be here at seven o'clock and everybody's invited. Uh, we can all have places to grow and that's the beauty of the Christian faith is that uh, we're never at a point where we say we're there. We keep continue to grow and God continues to amaze us. If I was going to ask you what are the most valuable things in your life, if, you, if I said to you, what are the 10 most valuable things in your life? I wonder what you'd answer. I'd say if I was going to be asked that question, three things that would be in the top 10 would be my family, my health, and my sanity. Those three things, my family, my health and my sanity. And all of those come into play in that fifth chapter of Mark. Uh, the, the part we didn't read was about a man who was possessed by demons and Jesus cured him of uh, his possession and gave him a clear mind. And then the two readings that we've got there one where a woman reaches out and touches Jesus' garment and is healed. And the part I love about that story is not just the healing, but the way he calls her daughter. Daughter. I wonder when was the last time she had received some sort of an affirmation like that. I can imagine her being a woman going through the marketplace and touching things and there's people saying, get away from here, don't touch those things. Or you stink. <laughs> Go away, woman, you're crazy. And Jesus reaches out and he calls her daughter. Daughter. Isn't that powerful? One word, daughter. And then in the story about uh, Jairus' daughter, where he says, tell her the coom, little girl, get up. And she comes to life. Can you imagine the impact that would have had on those three people, on the man possessed by demons, on the woman that was not well, and on Jairus and his daughter. And we hear nothing more about them. That's the end of the, the uh, that's all we hear. We hear nothing beyond that. But in my mind, I wonder if five or six years down the track, 
the woman who was healed, if somebody said to her, what happened to you? She said, oh, a man healed me, but I can't remember his name. <laughs> or if somebody asked Jairus about what happened that night, he'd say, oh, it's a bit vague in my memory. I can't quite recall what happened. That is certainly not what would happen. They would be overjoyed. Those situations would be indelibly marked in their mind and they would never forget their friend Jesus. And in a way that has a lot to do with that 2 Corinthians reading. The 2 Corinthians reading is on giving. And I know some people say, oh, here we go, another sermon on giving money to the church. I want you to think about those words that are there. And I want you to go in and look at those words that Paul says in 2 Corinthians with an attitude of gratitude. It's interesting that people are not often interested in certain causes until it impacts on them. One thing that people are very freely offering money to is cancer research because cancer seems to affect so many people. Michael J. Fox, the actor, is passionate about doing something to try and cure Parkinson's disease. Why is he so obsessed with that? Because he himself is a victim of Parkinson's disease. People who will raise money for children's cancer or for other things quite often do so. Diabetes, for example. They do so because somehow it is impacted on them or their family. And it comes in and it has meaning because it touches them where, they, where their heart is. And when we talk about giving, we are talking about giving in relation to how much Jesus has touched us. And Paul gives us, I've taken seven statements that Paul makes about giving. And that's the first one. We give in response to what God has given us. God's not interested in what we have. God's not interested in what we give. He's interested in the motive behind our giving. Can I tell you a little story? A few years ago, we were going through a very difficult time financially. And I remember one night, my wife and I, we put the kids to bed and we talked about this financial problem we had. How were we going to get out of it? Would we have to take a loan out and so on? And our children were asleep. Well, we thought they were, but one was awake. And the next morning, as we came out for breakfast on the kitchen table, was an envelope. And inside that envelope was, a, was 35 cents and a little note saying, hope this helps you with your problem. Now, 35 cents is nothing, but it's everything when a child gives from their heart because they see someone in need. And in all reality, God doesn't need our money. If God's God, he doesn't need us to give our 35 cents worth, but God delights in us giving from the heart and saying, here it is, Lord, do something with it. A little boy with five loaves and two fish is mentality. And God can perform a miracle if we're willing to give up what we have. The second point I want to make is verse 7. Have a read of verse 7. It says, excel in the grace of giving. That's a beautiful phrase, excel in the grace of giving. How do we excel in anything? We excel in something by practising. We excel in giving by practising giving. And sometimes we can be a little bit reluctant to give. But if we start with a small amount and entrust it, and then that releases us to be more generous in our giving. It takes practice to excel. But it says, excel in the, in the grace of giving. Just as God's grace is extended to us, we extend our grace in our giving. Some time ago, a parishioner said to me, Russ, you've never preached about tithing. And I said, do you want me to preach about tithing? Oh, yes, I'd love it. I said, well, why would you like me to preach about tithing? Because if you tithe, you're blessed. <laughs> so you tithe, you give money, so you will be blessed back. And I said to this parishioner, I don't think you'd like what I would preach. <laughs> because we are excelling the grace of giving. See, we give without expecting that there's going to be something coming back. 
we excel, Paul ex exhorts his group, people, the Corinthians, to excel in the grace of giving. Beautiful phrase, excel in the grace of giving. And the third point of these seven points is that it's not just about money. It's not just about money. We live in an age where money has lost its value to a large degree. And the thing that, you know, amongst, particularly amongst young people, that is the currency of our time, is time. It is more important to spend time with someone than to give money. And think about it for a moment, if we tithed our time, that's 2.4 hours a day we would spend with the Lord. Think about that for a moment. Do we tithe our time? It's not just about, it goes beyond money to relationships. If we invest in relationships, and, and we live in a world where communication is just, is, is at its point that it's never been before, but I've never seen so many lonely and isolated people. People walking out amongst the crowds and yet they are lonely and isolated. And we need to spend time not just on money, invest our money, but invest in relationships. And we need to invest in commitment. It's very easy to give $50 to a cause, $100 to a cause. But I know of people who go into places like China taking Bibles and they run a risk they're not only committing their time and their, their money to going in there to give Bibles, they're risking their lives. And so money is important. Jesus spoke about money a lot. He spoke about giving money. And, and we are called to give money generously. But our generosity doesn't stop at our, our hip pocket. We go beyond that to our heart our feet and our actions. It's not just about money. Paul says an interesting thing here, and it probably goes against what a lot of people think. Giving, he says, giving is not compulsory. In verse 8 he says, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love. He said, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love. We talk about tithing, and tithing is, probably, is a good guide. But if we strictly adhere to tithing, sometimes we can find ourselves getting caught up in legalism. I had the interesting um, experience of meeting a Pentecostal pastor who didn't believe in tithing. And he said, he said that he didn't believe in tithing because tithing was tied to the law. What the scriptures in the New Testament talk about a lot is generous giving. And when we think about tithing, and people talk about tithing, how do we tithe? Do we tithe our 10% before tax or after tax? Do we do it, um, do we give it all to the church or do we give it to the church and charities? Do we, um, do we, if we get a tax deduction, if our tithing is tax deductible, do we then take a tenth of that tax deduction and put it on. And, and what I'm saying is we can sometimes get so caught up in the legalities of what it's all about. We become like the Pharisees who try to become nitpicky in the way they justify the rules. And we, we forget that this is about what goes on in our heart. I want to tell you a story about three companies. And one was a local company around about here at one time, got its staff in and they said, uh, from today, we're not going to expect you to work 40 hours a week. You work what you think you want to work. We're not going to give you holidays. You can work out your own holidays. And if you feel sick, and we're not going to give you so many days sick leave. We, you work out what sick leave you need. If you need a day off, you take it. And so they threw it back on the staff to say, you decide what you want to do. It's a big risk, but you know what happened? The productivity of that place went up. People took fewer holidays than they normally would if they had been granted them. Because people felt that someone trusted them to give their time. Another firm got its people in and said, we've made a big profit this year and we want to share that among you. And so you're not employees, you are shareholders in our firm. Can you imagine the difference that had? And a third one I want to talk about 
is there was a, when the global financial crisis came, there was a CEO of a company who got all of his employees together and he said, I have never sacked an employee and I don't want to now, but I may have to. The only way I see out of it is if we all take a 10% cut. Are you agreeable to take a 10% cut so that you all are still employed? And they all agreed to that. But what he never told them, but they found out through the bookkeeper, was that he took a 100% cut. You see, Paul is indicating that we are not slaves. We are co-workers in building the kingdom of God. It's a bit like when uh, Christopher Wren was designing the uh, Westminster Abbey and, and all the bricklayers and everybody was working there. Somebody went around and they said to the first person, what are you doing there? He said, I'm helping to build a church. And the second person, he said to them, what are you, um, what are you doing there? So I'm working for two, two, pen, two pence a day. And he went to the third person, he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm helping Christopher Wren build the most magnificent building in all of England. Which one of those had the right attitude? We are partners in building the kingdom of God. Paul says another interesting thing. He exhorts them. He says, don't go beyond your limits in giving. Isn't that amazing? Don't go beyond your limits in giving. He says, you give according to your means. Isn't that amazing? You know, sadly, I think we go beyond that because I'm finding that the more comfortable we are, the less we give. In fact, they've estimated that the proportion of giving to charities or to churches has diminished over the last 50 years. As people become more comfortable, they tend to give less. But Paul is saying, don't go beyond your limits. Don't give so that you've got, you know, you've got nothing for yourself. Always keep in mind that you do that. And that happens to everything. I know of some people who give and give and give to the church until they're burnt out. And he said, there's times when you have to say, I can't give any more. But the exciting thing, he says, in, in, at the sixth point I want to make, is that your giving, your generosity does not go unnoticed. And while we don't expect a return on our giving, when you are in times of need, if you are a generous person, you find that people will become generous to you. They will respond. At the present, he says, your time... Oh, at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in, their, in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The early Christians were known for their sharing. And that was the thing that stood out. They were generous in their giving. And the final point I want to make is the example of Jesus. Paul says... Follow the example of Jesus in verse 9. Though he was rich, he became poor. And Paul is not just talking about Jesus and money. He's talking about um, Jesus giving up what was rightfully his to become poor and be one of us. In Philippians 2, 5 to 11, it says, Jesus you follow the example of Jesus, who was equal to God, but didn't claim that equality, but became a servant. He was humble. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross. Charles Wesley, in that famous hymn, says, He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. So there you have it, Paul's seven points. To give from the heart, to give from the heart, to excel in the grace of giving. And if you take nothing else away today, please take those words away with you. Try to excel in the grace of giving. We are called to give more than just financial needs. But 
We should not give beyond our limits. It's not compulsory. It's up to you. But generosity breeds generosity. Generosity breeds generosity. And finally, let us follow the example of Jesus. There is a story about a soldier in Vietnam who uh, hit one of his mates was injured and so they had to retreat and instead of leaving his mate there with the enemy, he carried him on his shoulders and took him till he got to a point of safety and he threw him in the trench where he was safe and just as he was about to get in himself, he was shot dead. And some time later, the parents of that boy who died found out that the man that they, he had saved was in that town. And so they invited him to a meal. And it was a disaster. The man turned up drunk. He was rude. He was very ungrateful. And the whole night was a terrible turnout. And as a man left, and they were glad to see him go, they shut the door. And the wife in her tears says, to think our son died for that man. To think our son died for that man. And you know, there are people in the world who don't acknowledge that Jesus Christ died for them. But the more it becomes a reality to who you are, the more you will be inclined to give. Because like Jairus, like the woman with the bleeding, like the man with the demons, once Jesus Christ comes into your life and you realise what he has done for you, you could never be anything but grateful. Let's pray. Loving God, we think of people who are struggling we think of people who are struggling with mental illness and emotional illness. We think of people who may be demon possessed, may be going through depression, may be overwhelmed by life, may be suffering dementia or memory loss. And Lord, just as you came to that man so many years ago, we pray that you would come to those people and bring them a, a, a level of knowing who you are. And Lord, we think of people who are suffering ill health, people who are reaching out to you to touch your gum. And Lord, we pray that they would experience your healing power on them. We think of people who've lost loved ones and the tragedy that they go through, the suffering they go through in that time. And Lord, we pray that at that time they would seek you and find you and find restoration in you. And Lord, we pray that you would instil in our hearts a sense of gratitude for what you have done in our lives, that we, in turn, may give of ourselves. As the Romans says, the book of Romans says, a holy and living sacrifice so that you might take the insipid waters of our offering and make them into a beautiful wine, just as you did in Galilee. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. We're now going to take up our tithes and offerings and of course, um, I just ask that you, if you're watching this, or just to hold your hands out in an attitude of offering yourself to God as well as your money. Lord, we, let's, let's do that now. Lord, we pray that you would accept what we have and who we are and use us to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you all. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen.